so let's get started. So on the part two, uh, we have um, a little bit of more topics added, uh, or at least more headlines to help cover um, what we go through today. So we'll start with innovation, go through market timing, ideation, opportunities, um, the digital landscape, ecosystems, platforms, focus on ideation, uh, look at the problem, solution, fit, planning, uh, evaluating opportunities, some of the funding options related to this development phase, and then towards the next milestone in the framework that we're using, so towards the validation phase. And then also the links for tools and res additional resources that are relevant specifically for this phase, and also to those sources that have acted as con contributors or inspiration uh, for this material or parts of the materials as, as well. So before we dive into the topic, let's recap what innovation actually is. So innovation is a new or renewed method, process, business model, product, and so forth that is validated to create new value compared to the previous solution. So the key ingredient here is that we are seeking to find, in, in, the, in the earliest phase possible, we are trying to find out that the idea has potential to become an innovation. And so that the innovation itself, uh, the key ingredient is that it actually creates new value. So just having something that is new and different uh, is not an innovation, that's invention. So, so we really in seeking this, this new value. And to, to basically uh, find that, we need to know what is that new value and to whom and how it is being generated. So basically within the context of, uh, of, of not only validating whether the idea has innovation potential, but also when we seek for ideas or when we prioritize multiple ideas that we could start to go in more of this uh, lean startup mode to start testing with real customers, uh, we can, the, the, the problem with ideas is that we can easily come up with, you know, five ideas, 10 ideas, 100 ideas, and we should not need to go all the way through for the uh, minimum viable product phase with all of those because we simply can't, we don't have uh, unlimited resources for that. So therefore, uh, this is good to have these uh, notions in mind when uh, thinking of the idea and uh, validating or at least prioritizing the ideas as well as coming up with better ideas uh, because there are good ideas and bad ideas, but how do we know? So we need to have some kind of tools to help us systematically also um, just by logic and, and, and additional research or background information or, or mentoring or support and feedback from others at least narrow down. Uh, the reality remains that none of those are true until they are really tested in the markets, but at the same time we still need some tools um, to, to be able to prioritize in what order we would validate them in the markets. <clears throat> so the innovation itself can be a combination of many elements, so it's not necessarily just coming up with, the, uh, with uh, you know, uh, a blockchain being a very hot thing or an AI being a hot thing, that's a technology. It's the, it's the new technology, it's a new thing that enable uh, new types of business model that enable new types of products, new types of services, um, but at the same time it's, uh, it's just new technology that is available pretty much to everyone. So the question uh, itself is, uh, while it's an innovation on its own and there are business models and companies built already or working on try that technology innovation as a technology solution into markets as their innovation, but at the same time technology itself is an enabler and just one component uh, because usually the, the actual innovation at customer-facing level 
and business model level is a combination of multiple factors. And, uh, and usually it, it involves these components. Sometimes it can be just a technology, sometimes it can be just a business model, sometimes it can be just improved process or market positioning. It also can be that some part, that business model is only iteratively uh, innovative, so it's a, it's a next version of an existing business model with slight changes that makes it 10% better. Uh, a technology that is taken, let's say, from medical industry to car industry, uh, some component that is actually transferable in technology space, and that is, 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 um, is transferred as a lateral innovation, moving it from one place to another. And then Positium positioning can be quite disruptive in this case, but the combination could actually be just one of these, multiple of these, and in any order. So the elements of innovation is, is already through this lens, is much broader than just thinking of an idea itself. And then when we have the mission as our framework, to whom are we looking to deliver what value uh, that are also the, the factors to validate that there actually is an innovation. Now we have a little bit of uh, kind of uh, identifiable components and concepts that we can use as well as the framework of mission that we are working within uh, uh, and then along with a vision uh, that communicates our ambition level. Now we have a lot of tools that we can work with that basically can also be used to set us criteria in which way we should uh, think about these things. <clears throat> so market timing, let's talk about market timing and uh, in, the, in, the previous, in the earlier sections in our, our, our uh, growth academy modules in the first one and also first part of this module, we discuss about um, the, the success factors of, of um, key success factors, five top ones for the market um, success and uh, the market timing is the number one. So market timing is at the same time seems to be the biggest factor and at the same time it is the, the hardest one to master uh, even with those with most experience. And I'll explain a little bit of why. So if we look at the, the kind of this, this, this uh, market chains with the very broad uh, holistic lens, if we look at how and what actually happens in the markets, um, basically there is the existing status quo. That is it's basically the dominant model in the marketplace. And then there's always going to be the new normal. So you can imagine this like the time before Google, the time before Facebook, the time before Uber, uh, the time before Airbnb. So there is a certain status quo model, how hotels work, how cab drivers work, how in online interaction worked in blogs and you know blog comments and, and things like that, or how the, how the search works. Basically what there wasn't search, there was these portals or index pages, how you know, information was collected for us to use it like a catalog. Uh, so there's a status quo of existing model until there's a new model and the new normal. And in this change, there's many innovators, there's many uh, startups and also new innovations by bigger companies or mid-sized companies, existing companies and even organizations on the public sector projects, research things, innovations in different shapes and forms that are looking at the problems, looking at the markets and trying and entering new solutions into markets and majority of those fail and some of the concepts and innovations become um, something that captures the market and proves that it generates it, it, um, a lot of value and it becomes the new norm and as such it becomes the new normal. So uh, if we take in case of Uber, of course they are no longer, uh, they haven't been for a long time, the only actor there, there's many actors, some re different regional, 
some uh, globally competing actors, uh, some national level actors that are already using the same or even um, improved version of Uber model uh, and that the whole notion of how uh, transportation, private transportation is, is going to work and that's the new normal um, that has succeeded to change the entire market. And it's still of course in process, there's still, you know, because it takes a while uh, to change. You can take the electric cars, that's clearly electric cars were actually before the gasoline cars, but because of the, the, the technology developments needed, there's a certain market timing when it actually starts to break in and become the new normal. On top of this, there's the global megatrends that are impacting these, and these are more of the, you can consider them as uh, parallel developments of multiple uh, megatrends. So, so some of these, like Uber business model, is also reflecting to other industries than transportation to give ideas and, and concepts of how that innovation of the business model or, or, or um, um, delivery model, whichever way or combination of those is delivered and that is inspiring new megatrends. On the other hand, also consumer behavior, like one big topic now would be um, uh, consumer privacy or uh, privacy in general, uh, the challenges that Facebook is having and all this uh, influence that can be done through uh, um, questionable use of user data to influence people's opinions in elections and all that type of things. Those are driving the types of global megatrends where consumers um, are starting to see uh, problems and regulators are seeing problems and those are generating the types of uh, megatrends um, that uh, are, are basically creating opportunities for new innovations to have success where they previously didn't uh, have uh, potential uh, to succeed. So this is the, the, the type of landscape that is all the time happening. This is the, the thing that some of the megatrends then enable or they even force the status quo to change. So, so we, we already know that Facebook and Google are behind the scenes working very hard to, to actually be able to adapt to, to some of the new regulatory changes or the upcoming regulatory changes um, that are developing. And, uh, and, and, and basically, these megatrends influence also the status quo factors and they give more room to the new innovations to have opportunity in the marketplace. So this is the landscape of, for, for kind of how to position, how to think of innovation. It's not just your own customer base, not just the mission, not just the, 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 the market, as it, how it looks, but to take into account this more broader picture. So the market timing really is the biggest factor for success, yet it's hardest to master or control. And basically, you should not even try to control. It's impossible if you are looking to make a big impact. You may have a significant influence to control in a smaller market uh, to get the status quo through. But on the other hand, that doesn't guarantee anything uh, for success in a broader market, if that's not where you started from. Uh, because actually what it can lead to is that when something is proven in the market and, and a bigger actor may see that proven in the marketplace is when it can also create uh, real competition faster. The ideas alone don't really create uh, competition. So, so that's not too, too, um, too risky area because there's millions of ideas and many people and many organizations have the same ideas at the same time. That's not rare at all in global scale. But what is rare is to have access to validated innovations where statistically or, or, or traction is really showcased publicly that this is really working. And, and, and in that phase, usually the competition, it becomes more fierce. 
So in the, in the sense, there is certain risk of validating ideas without having the ability to scale uh, at the same time. Uh, or starting in a small but visible market, specifically English-speaking countries. Uh, it's already more hidden in countries that, that are small, like Finland or, 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 or some other countries that have language that not many speak. So there's multiple protecting layers there. But I still wouldn't recommend to, to, to if, if the ambition is high, make sure that you start with, um, with big enough market and that you have scalability designed. You don't have to act like scalable yet, but you have to have it designed in that way. But don't worry too much about ideas. Those are not so you know, vulnerable situation yet because not many know about them and not really many care about ideas that have not been validated yet. So, the key to market timing is to really know what is your own position and, and timing within the context of the market timing and life cycle. And then also uh, we'll cover this concept of job to be done uh, as part of how to design uh, better ideas. And uh, it's, it's uh, important to connect this market timing con con content, uh, topic in that context. Uh, so we'll get back to that as well. <clears throat> so basically, um, if we think about the market market timing, there usually is this um, um, kind of this type of uh, market development image that there can be even quite long. And this is the hardest part: is how long is this slow development uh, from an idea before it hits mainstream? And, and there's a certain tipping point. And after which the market you know, it becomes obvious that that's the winning model that that is the future. So I would say a, a, a good example here would be to think the self-driving cars, uh, and that depends on when you became aware of self-driving cars concept. How early did you follow that? When have you come up, come across with the concept? But the earlier you saw it, I mean this goes all the way to. Uh, these DARPA competitions when they, they had competition of how a car can drive from point A to point B in a desert. And many of them, there was like a million dollar price or something. And I think this was perhaps like 15 years ago or something. And it was considered very difficult. And, and the, the development where we are today, I think majority of everyone in the technology space at least agrees that it's just a matter of time when, when this becomes uh, like the common thing uh, everywhere. But it's still, when we look at the business perspective and market perspective and capturing profits and revenues and uh, making real impact, it's still totally unclear who's going to win, what are going to be the fastest growing uh, segments of that or sub-segments. It's going to be the trucks, the buses, uh, closed area driving, certain cities, geographical location, certain street design uh, location, certain supporting infrastructure, whatever those are the, the factors. But it really gives this perspective of how long that pretty obvious development can be, yet very difficult to define when you should basically put all the efforts down trying to capture the market share you after of this future market that is developing. And this is same for for all the bigger innovations and, and those that aim to, to, to have an impact, at least one actor of changing that status quo. Uh, but it can be a very in a very narrow market, uh, but the, 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 the concept is the same. So um, when we were creating the first equity crowdfunding platform 2009, uh, we, this, this became very clear for us in how to, to, to uh, work in this and, and what kind of things impact uh, these types of developments and how to read into the markets and, and, and read the market signals of how the opportunity changes and how it grows and, and so forth. But this is the picture uh, to have in, in the mind and then knowing which side of the, the tipping point uh, you are either starting from or which part of the tipping point you're aiming to 
enter the market uh, or at which part of the time, you, time tipping point are you looking to scale into the market. So important to try as much as possible to read into this. And I know this is very difficult specifically for the first time, so even second time entrepreneurs, but it's still a big challenge also for the most experienced ones. But here's also very important to, to find channels to read uh, these and, uh, and here also a lot of the, the, the mentoring and industry actors knowledge can help. Uh, but sometimes the industry itself uh, don't accept that this change is even happening. So it's, it's very difficult. Uh, maybe one general point I try to make here is that initially, if you only see a lot of innovators, uh, a lot of, you know, free thinkers uh, cheering for it, and you see that number growing, then that's a positive sign, but that's not yet the sign that the market is there. Then when you start to see other startups popping up in different places and entering the market, if you start to see regulatory development starting to support that direction, those are all very strong signals, even if the regulations only are coming in several years time, but those are all very strong signals. When you start to see mid-sized actors getting into it, when you start seeing people who work in the industry and they start to leave from their own industry and start to uh, start startups and joining startups to build the new model, then you are very close to the tipping point. The tipping point still may be several years coming, but when you start to get big actors that start to really worry publicly or they start to do some activities, now you are at the tipping point or you are already past them. And the difference is that the market may be so slow that nobody is, is capturing the global leading position, or it can be so fragmented that it's very hard. But, but these are just some of the signals that uh, hopefully can be helpful in this. So the basics is, is anyway, the, the tipping point is key, need, knowing that are you ahead of the, the growth curve or you are after that. And the key is if you are ahead of this, you have the opportunity to be a pioneer, uh, but at the same time you have all the risks and uh, additional uh, burden of educating the markets and, and making the concepts and terminologies known. But at the same time, it gives you opportunity to get to speak to industry events uh, on the speaker stage, so you get a lot of visibility. So it's, a, it's an opportunity, but it has a different strategies that an opportunity is embedded within. And the challenge is really the, 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 in this phase to, to to both do the market education, but that's at the same time develop and sustain your own position and be prepared to, to act very fast when the market starts, if that's your aim. After the tipping point, you already have a lot of other people's failures, a lot of failed concepts, a lot of data that you can read in and read from their, their failures. What did they did right? What did they do wrong? And you have all that information to improve your concept to basically capture the, the, the following wave uh, of, of that growth or capture a significant position or trying to make it even better than the leading model at the markets, depending on what kind of resources you have at the time or what kind of uh, uh, position you have acquired. And here, specifically, it can be as simple as serving your customers better uh, or making your customers' user experience better uh, or a slight tweak to, to make that um, a really, really good one. There's always room for, the, for, for, let's say, two or three actors to get a significant market opportunity, significant position, until if these current models of how the platform economy works, the mon one monopolistic uh, actor wins. But that will take several years to clear uh, potentially who of those three uh, will ultimately win. But all of the three will most likely have a very good position in the global markets. 
<clears throat> but if it's more fragmented market, like for example, how equity crowdfunding came to play, it basically means that every country has a strong local actor. And it's very hard to make a global equity crowdfunding platform because of the factors driving uh, investing decisions, based basically trust, as well as uh, regulatory environment, different countries and different regions having different regulations, different languages that impact trust. And reading into the regulation terms, making the, the, the uh, investing in early stage companies uh, quite difficult at global scale. So these are just some of the examples here. The strategy